We've got that for posterity. Hopefully it's worth looking at. Um, and now with that on board, let's get started. So I'm gonna show you my screen. And here we go. So as I said, you know, graduated from Ross 2012. I definitely know what it's like to be in your shoes. So let me now give you a crash course on the PM interview. And I really appreciate everyone taking the time to participate today. I know there's tons going on on campus right now. You know, I've been talking to MBA ones, MBA twos, alumni in the last couple of weeks, and it sounds like every tech company under the sun is coming to campus. Everyone's getting their resumes ready. So I really appreciate you guys making the time. Now I'm going to make it really worth your while because unlike a typical MBA presentation, we sort of sit back passively and let stuff soak in. You're going to have tons of chances to actually practice. That's coming right up. In the meantime, though, let me just give you a little bit of information about myself. So thanks to Ross, I got a chance to intern on Apple's iOS team back in 2011. And after that, I went to work at LinkedIn full-time. I went on to lead growth for VC pack, VC-backed startup. And at every point along the way, I was hiring, hiring, hiring. The amazing thing about tech is you go right from being on the one side of the interview table as an applicant, as an interviewee, to the other, being an interviewer, a resume reader. And so I have certainly seen tons of folks come into this world from the MBA background, both in my function, product marketing, as well as in product management. And now I'm happy to say I've been bitten by the entrepreneurial bug out here in Silicon Valley. So I'm running my own startup, which is called Break Into Tech. And the goal is a very simple one. Because I saw exactly how hard it is to be in your shoes, to be trying to break into this world when all the other industries that recruit in business schools are so much easier. Consulting, finance, CPG, they have this really nice system all down and scientific, whereas tech, it's kind of on your own. You kind of have to figure it out as you go along. So I'm building this site and I'm building this resource to help anyone break into, tip, break into tech, no matter your background. And in addition to all that stuff, I actually called on five of my own classmates or recent grads of Ross to help me with today's presentation. Because the awesome thing about Michigan is that so many of its alumni go into tech and specifically into product management. And so five PMs from recent classes at Ross, from Zynga to Workday to EA, Amazon, and Walmart, all helped me out with their thoughts on the interview process. Now, before we get to what they said, let me go ahead and challenge a key product management assumption. When I first got into the tech world, I assumed the role was just for these guys. You know, the Steves, the Reeds, the Jeffs, those genius innovators that we read about all the time. But the thing is, I couldn't have been more wrong. And here's why. Back when I was at LinkedIn, I saw firsthand, and painfully so, what really makes a great PM. And here's the deal. When I was hired, LinkedIn was facing this existential crisis. Even though things were going really well at that moment in time, they realized they had this basic iceberg floating off in the distance about to take down their ship because they had the oldest users in all of social media. The only site with the worst demographic was that sketchy site classmates.com with all those pop-up ads. So LinkedIn CEO, Jeff Weiner went to my product manager and he said, we've got to get a younger demographic on here. If kids grew up with Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram, and those guys ever decide to move into the career space, they could kill us off. They could basically cut off our pipeline of new talent. And the thing is, it seemed like my PM was the perfect PM. Because any single time she went up to the whiteboard, it was like that scene out of A Beautiful Mind. You know, the one where John Nash is going up there and going crazy with equations and drawings and diagrams, which totally made sense because she had all the right credentials. She had a degree in industrial design from Carnegie Mellon. She had a PhD in systems theory from Northwestern. You know, if anyone was that typical G genius PM, it was her. And so based on that background, she laid out this incredible vision for a series of three different products that would totally rock the student world. And after three long years of development, of slogging through, we finally launched LinkedIn's first student offering last October. So far, so good, right? You know, typical story, huge challenge, genius product manager, followed by a mega launch celebrated in the press. It would seem that way, except for one minor detail. 
because just one week ago, LinkedIn actually pulled the plug on all of our products. With one single flip of the switch, three years of our lives, the work of 50 people went right down the drain. And you're probably wondering, you know, Jeremy, how could that be? Didn't that PM do all the right PM stuff? The beautiful vision, the beautiful mind. And the answer is actually no. Because instead of talking to current students and learning about what their pain points were, the PM based the entire product, all three years of our work, on just one student, her own daughter, who just happened to be kind of a beautiful mind genius herself, and who went to school with a bunch of other geniuses and an Olympic-sized swimming pool in Palo Alto. So not exactly a representative sample. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, when the engineers and the designers were duking it out, debating all these features, the PM was actually nowhere to be found because she was too busy rubbing elbows with all these education big shots, going to the Department of Education, hanging out with these thought leaders. And so even though the project was initially scoped to take just six months, it ended up taking three years. And a project that was supposed to serve all students basically served exactly one. But don't worry, don't feel too bad for LinkedIn because the story actually has a happy ending, which is that after the original PM resigned, kind of in disgrace, a junior PM, just like you guys, stepped up to take the role. Now she wasn't a PhD in systems theory. She didn't have a long track record in tech. She just had an MBA. And what she did have though, were two really important things. Number one, unlike the first PM, she listened really well. Instead of assuming that she knew what students wanted, she spent the entire first month in her new role just going around the country and listening, going from school to school, letting students do the talking. And so when she got back to Mountain View, she didn't immediately draw up some beautiful whiteboard. Instead, she focused on bringing the team together because as bitterly as they had fought in the past, she wanted them to come together, to collaborate, to brainstorm together, basically become a really cohesive team. She started scheduling team workouts, team events, even making sushi together. And the happy result is that they're actually about to launch their first app in a couple of weeks, a full month ahead of schedule. Plus, because that new PM listened, based on my own testing of the app and talking about it with students, I know that it's actually what students want, not what she assumed they wanted. So going back to where I started, my assumption that Steve Jobs was sort of the perfect PM was dead wrong. Because it turns out PM isn't for geniuses. Instead, it's for two kinds of people. It's for listeners, people who can really empathize with their users, put themselves in their shoes, and then develop products that serve those customers, not just themselves. And it's also for leaders. Because remember, no matter how fancy your degree is, no matter how high-powered your concepts, as a PM, you're not the boss of anyone. You don't own the engineers, the designers, the marketers. Instead, you have to lead through influence. And so communication and not control is your greatest power. So as we dig into the interview questions, let's keep these two points in mind. Because in my experience of both interviewing PM candidates in tech and doing tons of mock interviews on campus, these are the biggest stumbling blocks for PM candidates. Okay, so let's get, in, let's get into the nitty gritty here. So for the first kind of question, which is everyone's favorite, tell me about yourself. Now I know this is not specific to PM interviews, but I'm including it here for two reasons. Number one, it's the first impression that you make. The very first time you open your mouth in an interview and that gut instinct reaction is formed in the interviewer's mind, you gotta make sure that you blow it out of the water not that you stumble into it. But the problem is, in my experience, and when I was in your shoes, I found out that people blow that question more often than not. And here's what I mean. So again, going back to that listening and leading framework that I started with, I think the first major error that I see is not listening to the interviewer, not focusing on what they really asked. Because remember, the interviewer did not ask you to repeat your resume. They've got it sitting right in front of them. And yet so often I hear stuff like this, and this is just an example, this is not a specific person. Someone will say, you know, I went to undergrad at the University of Iowa, and then I majored in mechanical engineering. First, I worked at Caterpillar as a level two systems engineer, and I was responsible for the DIG 2.0 project. Then I went to John Deere, and I was a systems integrator for their automated mowing division. 
And then I came to Ross. Here I'm a member of the tech club and I coach middle school students. Then I want to get into product management. I'm considering Tesla and a number of other companies in the tech space. The thing is at this point, even just like 30 or 45 seconds into the pitch, the recruiter or the hiring manager is so bored because you've got that whole resume sitting right there. You don't need someone to replicate it. What I recommend instead, however, is to come in and do something totally different, which is to really focus on being a leader by taking charge and telling a compelling story. Because as JR, the Ross alum PM from Amazon says, storytelling, not technical skills, not genius leadership, is the biggest differentiating factor. And so here's how a really great leader and a really great communicator would tell that story, make it come to life. So they might say, okay, all my life, I've been passionate about building big things. That's why I started my career at Caterpillar, building the biggest construction machines on earth, the ones that literally built the cities of the 20th century. And while I love engineering, my true passion is to design world-changing products from start to finish. That's why I've come back to business school, to make sure that I have the strategic and leadership abilities to ship the next amazing products. And that's why I'm especially focused on Tesla, because not only do you guys build massive projects like the Gigafactory, you build products that are going to shape the next century and beyond. And so the reason that that answer succeeds is because even though it starts with the same facts as the first one, it turns them into something interesting, a story with a theme, a hero, a deep sense of passion. All right, so that's enough of me talking. Now it's your turn. And we can do this one of two ways, depending on what you prefer. So first of all, I'm curious if there's anyone who's brave enough to try answering this question right now as a demonstration for the group. Not only is it awesome practice, but you'll get immediate feedback and the whole group will learn really fast as well. So um, for the folks in the room, if you guys don't mind giving me a call back, I would love to see if there's anyone on the line over there who's brave enough to try this in front of the rest of the group. So Jason, give me a call at that phone number, please. Again, the phone number is 347-834-1737. And while Jason's calling in, start to think about how you would explain this based on the framework we talked about. Focusing not on reciting your resume, but on turning your resume into a highlights reel, a story that makes sense. All right, hold on one second here. Hey, Jason. Hey, thanks so much for calling. Do we have someone on the line who's willing to give us a shot? You want to try? All right. All right. So who do we have here? Hi, this is Bradley. Hey, Bradley. Thank you so much for being brave and giving us a shot. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yes, it was 100% a volunteer. <laughs> Uh-oh. Jason twisting some arms over there, huh? Cool. Um, yeah. Well, I promise you I'll give you good feedback after, uh, right afterwards, and the rest of the group just knows that you are incredibly bold to take the, take the first one for the team. So definitely appreciate it. Okay, so here's the deal. I'm going to give you a shot to sort of lay down your story in response to this. And again, it's not just your resume. It's not your odyssey. It's focusing on getting me motivated and leading me through communication. So Jason, or excuse me, Bradley, tell me about yourself. Tell me where you're coming from and what you're passionate about. So I'm a behavioral psychology junkie. I love trying to understand why consumers make decisions, especially on items they don't spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, in my first role, I had the opportunity to really explore that in um, a market insights capacity, so really doing market research and listening to doctors at Novartis Pharmaceuticals in Boston. After that, I had the opportunity to sort of continue down my career or take a different step and get closer to customers. And I spent a year in key account sales in San Diego. Um, after that, I wanted to explore the pricing side of things. So I wanted to understand why doctors were paying for services and spent a year doing insurance contracting and prices and pricing work. But then I realized, you know, that I'm getting a little too specialized. I want to be in product management. And although all those experiences are important, when being a product manager, I didn't exactly know how to be a product manager. 
So I decided to come back to Ross, focus on the strategic side, take all the experience that I had, and um, apply for project management roles. Very cool. All right, so Bradley, first of all, big props for being brave. Oh, um, I'm speaking into the uh, the main speaker right now. Do you guys have that muted? Do you guys have the uh, main speaker live? I just want to make sure the folks on the line can hear. Can you guys hear in the room right now? Okay. So hold on one second. All right, sorry about that, guys. Um, just trying to juggle two lines to avoid any echo. So um, first of all, Bradley did an awesome job. Um, he kept it super tight and concise, which is also the hallmark of a great story. I think that whole thing clocked in at maybe 60 seconds top, so that's great. Second thing that Bradley did really nicely is that um, you know he was crystal clear about what happened. He didn't wander around sort of diving into little details here and there, getting lost in the story. He kept it moving. And great stories always have great momentum. I think the only critique I would have of Bradley's story, and again, uh, I think Bradley did a great job on, on average, is that he got a little bit into the sort of step-by-step -step sequencing that actually you don't care that much about as an interviewer, about every last role, why he did this, why he did that. I know that Career Services talks a little bit about you know, making sure that your odyssey makes sense and is logical, and I totally agree with that. But what I really want to hear is I want to hear a super streamlined story it takes me right from where you started with a passion and a desire to where you are today. And so if there were detours along the way, you can edit those out. Because ultimately, just like a PM would go to a team and give a very cohesive story about what they're trying to accomplish, you as an interviewee for a PM role to be able to give a very cohesive story about what you've done in your career. And I know that's tricky because so often our careers are not cohesive, right? They're one crazy step after another one random opportunity after another. But the trick is in the editing. Just like a great Hollywood movie starts with hundreds of hours of footage and an awesome editor boils it down to 90, sec 90 minutes of really taut action, you wanna take 100 hours of your career and boil it down to 90 seconds of pure action-packed storytelling. So great job, Bradley. Um, and remember, as you guys go along here, really try to focus on those two things, listening to what the interviewer wants and then leading with great communication, in this case, storytelling. Nice job, Brad. So now let's move on to the behavioral questions. So these are those famous tell me about a time kind of questions. And you're going to get them all the time in PM uh, interviews and in product marketing interviews, basically anywhere you interview in tech. And I think this is kind of the perfect one that I would want to ask a PM candidate. And I actually have asked PM candidates. Because again, going back to my story, it really speaks to the soft power nature of PM leadership. Unfortunately, I usually see about two major errors here. First, on the listening side, I often hear a lot of, okay, yeah, so I did that. So I told my engineer to do this, and then I told my designer to do that. And unfortunately, it not only misunderstands the question, which is about soft power and influence, but it also shows a real lack of empathy. Remember that first PM at LinkedIn? She wasn't interested in understanding her engineers or her designers. She was more focused on, just bringing her own beautiful vision to life. And as a result, that team was under-motivated to execute her project, which is why it stretched out so long. So really demonstrate empathy when you answer that question. And then on the leading side of things, I also get this kind of mistake. So we had this project to do, Jeremy. Then I did this, then I did that, and that's how we got our result. And the big area here is that you're so quick to rush in and start telling about all these amazing things that you did you never set the stage. You never played that role of a masterful communicator, an awesome leader, to explain why this was either important or even challenging. And the result is as an interviewer, I come away less than impressed. And like Chrissy over at EA says, I also don't feel really connected to you. I don't have that human to human connection that everyone needs, even in the tech world. So here's an example of a better answer that incorporates both good empathy and stage setting. So here's what you might do using that same Caterpillar example. So the biggest team challenge at Caterpillar was that I was a junior engineer right out of undergrad. And all of a sudden, I was working alongside people with 30 years of experience at a company that's nearly a century old. 
But one of the first things I realized when I got there was that the company was using this antiquated design technique and it was costing us millions on each project. Now, I wanted to say something right away, but I knew it would look bad if this young guy comes in and starts rocking the boat in his first week. So instead, I put myself in the shoes of my colleagues and I realized that the best way to make each person feel like an expert would be to have them buy in individually, not try to pitch them as a group. And so even though it was super labor intensive, I made sure to set up coffee meetings with every single engineer on my team. And that way I could float the ideas by them individually first. That way, the next time that we sat down with the boss in our big team meeting, everyone else ended up proudly pitching my idea because they felt some partial ownership over it. They were excited about it on an individual level. And with that kind of veteran consensus in the room, you know, the boss was totally willing to give it a shot, which ended up saving the company $2 million just in that first year. So obviously, again, theoretical example, but the important thing is, is that you're going to get me excited as an interviewer if you set the stage. And in this case, I can totally imagine this young gun taking on the establishment. I can feel how anxiety provoking that must be, that sense of wading into danger, of potentially being seen as this arrogant recent grad. But then you surprise me because instead of getting in a fight, instead of being arrogant, you really understand and inspire your colleagues, which of course, for our purposes, is the hallmark of a great PM. Okay, so that's that. Now it's your turn. Let's see if there are any volunteers this time and give me one second while I get the phone set up again. Hold on one moment. All right, Jason, are there any volunteers in the room right now? Anyone is willing to give us a shot? Yep. I can hear you guys right now. Do we have a volunteer or a recruit? Jason, are you twisting some arms over there? Man, you're already doing influence. Good. Okay. Uh, let me take a stab at this. Who's, who's, who's on the line right now? This is Satish. Satish. Hey, how are you? Good to, good to hear from you again. Um, so, yeah, um, so Satish, you know, thanks so much for um, thinking about this one with me here. Tell me about a time in your background when you influenced the team, not as a boss necessarily, but as an individual contributor who took sort of voluntary leadership and helped lead a team to the right decision. Uh, before I go on, I want to know like how long you expect this particularly to be. Um, in terms of the time length for the answer? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So I think this one has a little bit more leeway than the first question that we tried because now you're really diving into the nitty, nitty gritty. It's not so much about telling this sort of broad story as really diving deep on the specific things you did in this very challenging context. So I would say feel free to use up to three minutes so long as you have three minutes of quality substance. Hi, let me start. Uh, while I was working at NVIDIA as a hardware engineer, uh, I was trying to implement a design which would uh, enable NVIDIA to do easier inventory management for their product. And this was a hardware change in hardware design. In order to get this design to get successfully implemented, I needed other stakeholders to buy in into this uh, into this design change, which it included uh, the operations team, it included the product engine, engineering team, it included the software development, as well as the other hardware engineering teams. All of them had to agree upon. Uh, but right from the outset, I knew that the software development team had a lot of responsibilities, had a lot of other tasks that they had to do, and they wouldn't sign on because they in order for this design to, uh, in order for them to accept the design, they have to do a lot of additional work on that. End. So one of the things was I, I uh, worked with a, uh, a team across in China in order to come up with a very detailed proposal and a plan of implementation. I discussed with the software development team what they are capable of doing, what they, uh, what they would not be capable of doing. I listened to them, and then I got an understanding of, uh, you know, what work should be 
and uh, the, how work should be divided up between the software development team and my own engineering team. And based on that knowledge, I uh, we came, we negotiated, and we came up with a proposal by which the software development team uh, agreed to take upon that task. And uh, after a couple of weeks of such negotiations, we came up with a uh, implementation plan that was mutually agreeable to both of us. The end result, uh, the the design change we originally wanted in uh, wanted in, it is now. I think it got implemented in uh, 2012, and it's now in all uh, all chips produced by Nvidia, which I thought was a big win. Very cool. Hold on one second. All right. So first of all, Satish, big props, because that's a tough question to handle, certainly on your own, but especially in front of a crowd. So thank you for taking that on. Um, what I liked about Satish's answer there was that, again, just like Bradley before him, even though he had more time to work with, he kept things concise. You know, it just, It's just not going to sort of suit you very well in the interviewer's mind if you're supposed to be this really effective leader as a PM, but you can't even control your own communication. So the fact that he kept it tight, about two minutes, was really strong. I also like the fact that um, he sort of led with this logical sequence from one thing to another. It made sense to me, and I could follow along pretty well. Uh, my only sort of constructive criticism for Satish is that I think even though he did a good job of sort of explaining the different actions that he took, he didn't really set the stage quite as viscerally as I would like. Because again, if I'm a recruiter and not necessarily a super technical person, I'm not going to be as engrossed in the technical details. And so if he can really sort of put it into a human drama where I understand, you know, what the stakes were, um, why this was such a big challenge, I might be more bought in and more sort of um, totally captivated by his story if he starts out with something a little bit more engaging at the beginning. But again, that can be worked on. I think he nailed the, the middle part as far as sort of walking me through the actions. And he ended with that nice happy ending, which is, of course, a great conclusion to any story. So nice job, Satish. All right. Great job for all the volunteers so far. Now let's go ahead and tackle the really good stuff, product questions. So of course, if you're truly passionate about being a PM, these are the questions that you live for, the ones that you're so excited to take on. But again, just because you've got passion, just because you have excitement, you have to be careful of avoiding a couple of traps. Now, first of all, as much as we all love products, we have to resist the temptation to just give our own knee-jerk reactions. You know, the kind of thing that would say, in response to this question of, you know, what should LinkedIn do with this mobile app? You know, I really hate those icons in the mobile, LinkedIn mobile app. Let's start by changing those. You know, they just turn me off so much. Because as Yi from Zynga points out, we've ultimately got to root our decision making in what's good for the customers and the company. So just like a great PM in my LinkedIn example listens to students, a great PM here starts with a user and then works down to what they should actually do. The other thing is, while it's tempting to just cover a bunch of these ideas in sort of a stream of consciousness approach, you know, like first I do this, then I do that, third I would do this one, it's really hard for interviewers to follow that. It just doesn't flow very logically. So again, you can show examples of leadership by leading from the very beginning of your communication. Start with this technique that I call signposting. And here's an example. So if you want to answer this question really well about how you would improve LinkedIn's mobile app, you have an answer like this one. So I'm gonna tackle this challenge through four steps. First, I'm gonna identify who the target users of the product are. Then I'm gonna to try to nail down what they actually care about. Third, I wanna identify any disconnects between what the user's needs are and what the current product offers. And then lastly, I'm gonna to try to solve those disconnects with specific feature improvements. For example, let's say that salespeople are our main target of the app since of course, they're already power users of LinkedIn and they're always on the go. So if I put myself in the shoes of a salesperson, I can imagine that the main use case is to look up contacts right before a meeting on the road. That way, no matter what meeting I'm walking into, I'm always prepared. Well, in that case, I would guess that one of the biggest disconnects is how hard it is to find people on mobile. You know, maybe I'm walking into the meeting, maybe I'm even driving, God forbid. I don't always know how to spell my contact's last name, or I don't have time to do lots of searches. And so ultimately, the idea is nice of being able to find people, but the execution is poor. I just can't find the right person right when I need them. So maybe we can solve this disconnect in one of two ways. Number one, maybe we can import the user's calendar 
So we can auto recommend profiles based on who they're meeting with. So kind of a page out of Google Now where we actually use a little bit of machine learning and a little bit of data importation to stir up the right person at the right time. Or if we're not gonna do that, we can just add more fuzzy logic to our mobile search, just like Google does. So even if you don't spell the name right, we can still intuit who you're looking for based on close matches. And so of course, that's a very simple example, but for your purposes, guys, it's a good example of signposting. That classic debate technique, if you've been watching any of the political debates, which is spelling out the steps for the interviewer so they can follow along. They have that mental scorecard in their head and they can check off step one, step two, step three, I got it. And of course, if you're gonna do that, you also have to always bring it back to the user. Their needs are more important than your own. So now it's your turn. Now I've already given you the LinkedIn challenge, so let me give you guys a new one so my answer doesn't bias you. And let's see if there are any volunteers to take this one on. So hold on one second here. Any volunteers in the room? Uh oh. I hear I hear a little wheeling and dealing on campus going on. The other thing is if any of the folks on the line would like to try this, absolutely feel free to chat or raise your hand. We can give you guys a shot as well. Anyone in the room, Jason? All right, hold on one second. I'm just gonna put the presentation on pause for a moment so I can see if anyone's raising their hand. Hey, Kanika, I see you there. If you're interested, just raise your hand. Okay, be sure. Hold on, Gary, so I can try. Do we have Do we have a willing uh, participant here? Yeah, yeah. Well, I I got one volunteer by someone else too, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Who's this? Um, my name is Adi. Hi, Adi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you so much for, um, if not volunteering, at least being willing to be volunteered. So I appreciate that. Yeah, being, being pushed over the, the cliff. <laughs> um, okay, so right, give... let, me, let me set it up for you. So give you a second to sort of think about it. Um, and the other thing I should note is you guys should always feel free to leverage the goodwill of the interviewer because these guys actually want you to see you succeed and say, hey, just give me a second. Let me outline my thoughts. Because as smart as PMs have to be, no one expects you to come up with a genius product on the spot. Instead, what they really expect is world-class preparation followed by world-class communication. So if you want to take a minute to get your thoughts together, that's totally fine. But while you do that, let me just throw it out again. You know, there are all these products flowing, floating around the valley and around the world these days. Everyone's finding cool stuff on product hunts and all over the place. Tell me, Adi, about an example in your mind of a poorly designed product and then the specific steps you would take to improve it. Absolutely. Um, so one that comes to mind is uh, Google's charting application uh, that they offer to Google uh, Docs and Google Apps. Um, when I think about how users are trying to use that, they're often trying to demonstrate certain flows and certain dynamics of how processes are taking place within their companies or within their systems or in various different contexts. So the Google chart is really, it's a static flow charting application. So it's something that never gives you a sense of how things are moving within the system. So whenever you're trying to use that to create a design or, or communicate that design, it doesn't show you where you are and where you're trying to go. So to improve that, I, I would add some sort of default animation uh, selectable within Google charts and have those uh, be able to demonstrate certain common flows like um, moving from one step to the other or connecting from one step to the other, or making a choice. That way, as both the designer as well as the viewer, it's very easy for me to, to communicate, to, to make the communication that I need, as well as to understand and to ingest the information that the uh, designer is trying to communicate. Cool. Anything else you want to add in terms of, you know, how you would go about figuring out the right way to implement that or the right way to test it? Absolutely. So first thing is I, w I would try to understand what is the purpose of using that product. Uh, try to find out what are the common use cases and try to see what 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 is the, the design they're trying to communicate. Um, and then I also understand what they're trying to do right now. Like what are their workarounds for trying to get this particular job done. 
Um, and then based on that, I would try to extrapolate into what can we add to the base product in order to really allow those users to communicate what they're trying to do. Great, great. All right, I'm going to put my phone on mute here. I'm going to answer for the whole group. All right, so first of all, again, thank you to Adi. Probably the most difficult challenge so far. So I appreciate your bravery in taking it on, or at least being volunteered. Um, and so I think Adi did a fine job given that you know, it's only November and you guys have tons of time to practice. But I do think that he fell into a couple of traps there, which is that number one, I didn't hear a lot of focus on who the users are. So personally, I'm actually not that familiar with the Google charting product. I have no clue what it does. And even though I gave a little bit of description, it didn't give me a sense of who it's for. Is it for businesses? Is it for end users? What kind of people in particular are using it? That would have, again, showed that sort of consumer orientation that we look for in product managers even on the enterprise side. Because even in the enterprise, you still have to peel back the layers of bureaucracy and say, who's going to use this product at the end of the day? And then I think the other trap that I mentioned is that, um, again, it's tempting to go right into features because we're all end users ourselves. And so we say, oh, I hate this thing about Snapchat or I hate this thing about Google+. But the trick is for a recruiter or for a hiring manager who's interviewing you, they're not so much focused on the answer because there really is no right answer. What they're focused on is the process. They want to see how logical is your mind? How analytically can you pick things apart step by step as opposed to jumping to the right answer? And I say right answer in quotes because, again, you know, tech is full of shades of gray. If you just show up to a meeting as a product manager and say, hey, we're going to do this, like the first PM did at LinkedIn, you're going to get a lot of pushback because people are going to have their own gut instincts. And so the much more effective way to lead is through clear, logical communication. Here's how I'm thinking about this problem. Let's test those assumptions. Are we making progress? Are we getting closer to serving our customers? And so if Adi had laid out a bit of a, um, the steps and the framework that he was gonna use to solve this problem before diving into the solution, that would have helped me follow his flow and be impressed by his logical nature. So again, big props to Adi for giving it a shot. But just like I mentioned in my setup, really focus on the end user first and foremost. That should be your North Star. And then once you have them in mind, really set up a logical framework, one, two, three, four, that you want to go through before you dive into the answer. And if that involves taking a little bit of time to set up, so be it. The recruiter would rather hear you be your best than hear you be the fastest. All right, now it's time for the best part of all, which is, of course, estimation questions. So the good news is these questions are no longer so crazy as they used to be. You know, Google and Microsoft before it we're well known for these nutty questions about, you know, if you were shrunk down to the size of an ant and you were dropped into a blender, how would you escape, blah, 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 using the laws of thermodynamics. And the thing is, um, Google's own SVP of talent has recently posted on the New York Times that all of their own internal testing shows there is no correlation between solving crazy sort of brain teasers like those and being a good engineer or a good PM or good whatever. What they do want to make sure, though, is going back to that last challenge with Adi, that at the end of the day, you at least have the analytical chops and the analytical approach to life where you can take a challenge and pick it apart step by step. Not so much can you solve a crazy brain teaser, but can you at least be very, very sequenced in your thinking and prove that to them? So once again, in this particular case, how many windows are in New York City? The secret is not about getting the right answer. It's about how you get it, which means that lots of folks are going to lose out right in the first minute because they're not listening. And so they rush to find that answer, which means that they totally botch the process. For example, in this situation, you might assume that the interviewer is focused on buildings, when in fact, she also wants to know about subway windows or car windows or even glass displays at the Bronx Zoo. And then the corollary of that is, if you wanna make sure that you're headed in the right direction, constantly lead, constantly engage and communicate with the interviewer by throwing out these trial balloons. So that way you're not missing anything obvious. So here's an example of how you might do that for this case. So here's, um, here's the approach I would take. So before I begin, I just wanna confirm that you only want traditional building windows. Is that correct? Okay, good. So knowing that, here's how I'd approach this. I'm gonna start with the assumption that there are three main categories of windows in New York. Residential, offices, and retail. The other ones like the car windows, we're keeping them out of them based on what you just shared. So obviously there are gonna be outliers in the building space like libraries that might not fit into one of those categories, but 
would you say it's a fair assumption to sort of throw out the outliers and focus on those three categories, residential, office, and retail? Cool. Okay. So let's calculate each of those separately. For residential, I'm going to round up a little bit and say there are about 10 million people living in New York. And again, when you, write, when you say New York, you mean just the city, right? Not the whole metro area with Long Island and New Jersey and all that. Good. Okay. And it seems like the vast majority of those live in apartments from everything I've heard. So based on my experience living in two-person apartments, I usually have about six windows, I would say. That's what I've had in Ann Arbor and the Bay Area. And if I use that as a logical assumption, let's say that there are three residential windows per, per person or about 30 million residential windows total. Again, three per person, 10 million people living in the city limits, 30 million residential windows. So that's that. Let's move on to offices. So a lot of folks commute into New York every day. And I'm going to assume that in the working day, between 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, the population of New York actually swells to about 30 million, because I've heard of the metro area, something around that. And so, um, you know, would you say that's sort of fair, like that 30 million figure? Okay, good, good. So again, in my experience, there are probably about three workers per window when you factor in the palatial offices of bosses versus the cubes that most people work in. And so let's say that there are about 10 million office windows across the city. Um, based on that ratio. We've got 30 million office workers, three workers per window, leads us to about 10 million office windows. And sort of testing that assumption, I know that there's a much lower ratio uh, than for residential, but it seems like you just don't need as much natural light because you're going to have all those overhead fluorescent lights that are really terrible, and you're also going to have a need for efficiency um, as a company. So that's where I sort of feel that figure um, turns out nicely. And lastly, it's hard to know just how many retail locations there are. But let's say that it's roughly about one third of the space in New York, just sort of dividing on average. In that case, if we figure that retail is probably better window than office space, because you have to have nice natural light and good aesthetics, but fewer than homes, because again, you need some kind of efficiency here, let's average the two, so residential versus office, and say that there are actually 20 million retail windows. So again, 30 million residential windows, 10 million office windows, 20 million retail windows, sum that all up, gives us 60 million in all. Okay, so that was a pretty fast example, but I really wanted you guys to focus on how I tested the assumptions throughout and constantly gave the interviewer a chance to steer me back on the right track, to say, hey, that's not what I was thinking. We were going down the wrong approach. Because like JR says, the really critical thing to do, again, being emp empathic here, is to put yourself into the interviewer's shoes. Try interviewing your classmates as much as you can, as well as doing mock interviews. And that way, once you understand how this works from the interviewer side and how they're looking for certain assumptions, you're actually gonna be a better interviewee. You're gonna be better on the other side of the desk. So now it's time for you guys to give it a shot. So I know this is a massive question here. How many queries per second does Gmail get? But again, please remember those key takeaways. This is not about getting the right answer. This is about your process. And you're certainly not alone here because you have me as the interviewer on your side to answer any questions and to push back on any incorrect, incorrect assumptions. So let's see if there are any folks either on the line or in the room who are willing to take this one on. This is the last shot here, Jason. Anyone left who has not been volunteered already? And of course, if you're on the line and listening and willing to give it a shot, just raise your hand and I'm happy to do it live with you as well. I feel like I should do what the tech company is doing, like give out swag to people who are willing to give this a shot. <laughs> All right, let's do it this way. Because not everyone has had a chance to participate, let's actually have everyone break up into pairs and you guys can practice on your own. And so that way, at the end of this, everyone will have had at least one shot to do a little bit of practice. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let you guys break into pairs, and on my screen, I'm going to put on a timer. So that way, 
you can actually get a sense of sort of the time limits that you're up against. So please break up into pairs right now. Again, there's no judgment here. We're all just practicing as friends. And spend um, about three minutes trying to take it on. Um, first, the first person will go, and then the second person will go. All right? So hold on one second. I'm going to put myself on mute here. Okay, so what I'm doing is pulling up my timer. You guys have three minutes starting now. So first, first person, start answering this question. How many queries does Gmail get per second? Okay, 30 second warning. Okay, time's up. Please switch roles. The interviewer becomes the interviewee and vice versa. And now your new three minutes starts.
Okay, 30 second warning. All right, time's up. So um, thanks everyone for uh, gamely pairing up and taking on this challenge here. Um, I feel bad not to allow time for feedback, but I do want to wrap things up on time. So please make sure that you have a chance to chat with your partner afterwards for tips on organization, testing assumptions, approaches, etc. cetera. Um, that said, just to finish up here, I want to leave you with a couple final thoughts. Before I do that, any questions? Um, Anyone in the room, feel free to just chat up. Anyone online, feel free to chat right through the GoToWebinar tool. Okay, so I think I got I think I got the gist of the question. Sorry about the feedback there. Um, so here's the deal. You guys say, if you have this math question and the math is starting to get out of hand, you're trying to juggle five different numbers and you're dividing them and multiplying them and things are getting crazy. How do you handle that? Well, I think the first thing is you got to have everything written down. Please, please, please do not try to keep everything in your mind for two reasons. One, you get disorganized and two, the recruiter can't see it. So you don't get the benefit of all the great work that you're doing. So obviously the best opportunity is to do it on the whiteboard if you have it. If not, just do it on a pad and make sure that the recruiter can see it. Second thing is, always try to round. Like don't get yourself into situations where you're dividing things by 3.5 and getting you know, all these remainders and whatever. Just like I did in my example, say, yeah, there's probably like 9.1 million people in New York, but for our purposes, it's 10 million. Yeah, there might be 27.2 million offices, but for our purposes, there's 30 million office workers. So hopefully those kinds of tips will make the math a little less painful. Any other questions besides estimations, product questions, strategy questions, behavioral questions, go ahead and type those in. All right, I think Jason is saying that was the last question. So of course, let me just leave you with a couple final thoughts here. So, um, just to wrap up, let's bring it back to our framework. So just like in my story at LinkedIn, your success in this world is not about being an egomaniacal genius, not by being a Steve Jobs or even the PM that I had at LinkedIn. Instead, it's much less about genius, much less about technical skills, than it is the simple act of listening and leading. Number one, can you understand your customers? And number two, can you lead your teammates through great world-class communication? So take a piece of advice from every single Ross PM that I spoke to, from Zynga all the way to walmart.com. Practice those two concepts big time. Practice listening, focusing on what the interviewer wants, most importantly, what customers want. Lead by being organized, by giving clear signals to the recruiter or the interviewer where you're headed, and by getting them invested, by setting the stage through juicy storytelling. Now, if you need someone to practice with, just know that you can actually book me for mock interviews through the career counseling system. It's the very favorite thing that I do. I'm so sick of resumes, just like you guys, but I love to do mocks because I'm going to be the toughest interview you ever had. But the nice thing about it is just like a basketball player who practices on a too small rim. By the time that you walk into the actual interview, it's going to seem like a piece of cake. So sign up for those. And also know that I want you guys to have the very best luck as you journey out into this awesome world. PM is by far the coolest role out there in the tech space. And I can say that as a product marketer. I was jealous of the PMs that I knew. So I really can't wait to see not only your awesome success, but the beautiful products that you build in the years to come. Thanks all, and happy travels. Bye now.